um, who is the astronomer, astronomer uh, sorry, public astronomer at the um, Royal Observatory in Greenwich, and um, is a PhD in astronomy. Um, I have to say, today was the first day I met Merrick, but I, I'm going to embarrass him by saying I already have a favorite story. We were discussing the movie Gravity over lunch, and he mentioned that for him, one of the hardest parts was seeing the Hubble telescope destroyed by a piece of space debris. It's the only bit I cried at, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't care about George Clooney dying, but that was quite sad. So, I thought that was great. Anyway, fair Thanks, Joel. I do have a confession to make, because I spent 10 years observing very distant galaxies with the Hubble Space Telescope, and as someone who studied the very distant universe, I wasn't that interested in the moon. Um, I thought it was a bit too nearby and a bit boring. <laughs> but now at Greenwich, my roommate as public astronomer has expanded to include the whole universe, not just distant galaxies. It's slightly daunting. But over the last five years, I've discovered that the moon is really, really interesting, and it's become one of my favourite objects in the universe. So my talk is really my kind of personal love letter to the moon and my scientist's exploration late in my career as astronomer of discovering what we know about the moon. Um, and here it is, we're all familiar with the moon. We've seen the moon, everyone in the human race has seen the moon for the whole of human history. It's been a constant companion. But in the last, well, human lifetime, our idea of it and our view of it has changed utterly. And I think that's a really incredible thing. We live in a very, very unusual period and a very exciting period in human history. And here it is, here's the moon compared to the Earth side by side. You can see the moon is about a quarter the diameter of the Earth, and that means it has about one sixteenth the surface area. So the total area of the moon is about the same as the land area of Africa. So if you've ever been to Africa, that's quite a lot of land, quite a lot of um, space to explore. But actually this picture is misleading because the moon is much further away from the Earth than that. Um, but we'll see that in a moment. Bernard and, um, and B mentioned that the moon is unusual. The Earth is unusual in having such a large moon. And here is the Earth, and here is our moon. And these are the, the other moons of the solar system. And you can see Mars has two tiny, tiny moons. They're really just little asteroids. Um, Jupiter has some big moons about the same size as ours. Titan has one moon that's sort of com comparable. And Neptune has another one. But these planets are all huge planets, much bigger than the Earth. So the Earth is very unusual in having a moon that's so close in size to it. Only Pluto, which isn't really a planet, has a moon of comparable size. It's all right. Pluto, Pluto is something more interesting than a planet. Pluto is a dwarf planet, which is a whole new category of objects that we don't really understand. So I don't think Pluto really minds. It's much more exciting than it used to be. But here is the Earth and the moon at their correct relative distances. And this yellow bar is showing you how long it takes a beam of light or radio waves to cross the distance between the two. About 1.2 seconds. Um, and this is if you've seen Katie Patterson's or heard Katie Patterson's Moonlight Sonata installation downstairs. This is what she did. She fired the notes as a radio wave at the speed of light to the moon and they bounced back took 2.4 seconds. Um, so she turned the Moonlight Sonata into a form of moonlight, reflected radiation, really beautiful. But that's how long it took to get there and then to come back again. And we've been wondering about the moon for ages. We kind of always had this idea that it was connected to the Earth. And this is an early idea of where the moon may have come from. The Earth spinning very quickly on its axis and the moon kind of sort of blobbing off the side. Um, that, that theory doesn't hold water anymore. And this is, as, um, as Bernard actually showed us, more of our current idea that it was a massive impact, a, a Mars-sized object very early in the history of the solar system in a very similar orbit to ours, not a stable system, the two collided. And Massive, it's the biggest explosion in the history of the Earth, and here we go, smashed material into orbit, which coalesced to form the Moon. Um, and as it does so, the Moon forms very close to the Earth, so when the Moon formed, it probably would have covered about a quarter of the sky, and it's been gradually receding from us ever since then, and it's still receding about 3.4 centimetres per year, about the same rate that your fingernails grow, the Moon is getting further and further away from us. But of course that process of impacts has continued. That wasn't the last impact that the solar system saw. And the moon and the Earth have been bombarded um, pretty heavily um, in the early history of the solar system anyway. And that's where these craters come from. And these enormous seas are actually huge crater beds that then flooded later with lava, which then solidified. And that's what the, the dark gray areas on the moon, when you look up, you're actually seeing plains of solidified lava. So these are younger features than the, the mountains around them. 
And this is what we think the interior of the moon might be like, although we still don't know, and a lot of expeditions are trying to find out what's inside the moon. Kind of a, a vaguely similar structure to the Earth, so some sort of solid inner core may be made of, of iron, much, much thicker kind of um, rocky layer around it, as the moon has a, a smaller core relative to its size than the Earth does. Um, but we still don't really understand what's going on in there, all sorts of interesting things. There are moonquakes, but they're not as severe as earthquakes. And here's one of my favourite astronomical images. I do a lot of talks to school kids, and they always say, what's your favourite planet? And I think they're always a bit disappointed when I say it's the Earth. But of course it's the Earth. The Earth is the most beautiful, varied and fascinating planet we've so far discovered in the universe. And here it is, a picture taken by the Galileo probe on its way to Jupiter, sort of postcard back to home. And you can see the Earth here and then the Moon in the background formed from the same material at about the same time, at the same distance from the sun, so they receive the same heat and light, but so different because the moon was not big enough to hold on to an atmosphere. So the moon, dead, airless and barren, and the earth with this blanket of air, of water, um, of life. So a really beautiful picture that sums up why where we live is such a special place. And the moon is a constant reminder that just being at the right distance from the sun is not enough to make you habitable. And the moon helps to make us habitable, and, and, and B and Bernard both alluded to this. The moon helps to keep the Earth's axis stable. Um, it does vary slightly by a few degrees over thousands of years, but Mars, for example, it tilts back and forth like this, and Mars' climate is much more variable than ours. So this may have been one of the things that helped life to get a foothold and, and develop on the Earth. And of course the Moon raises tides on the Earth. The Moon's gravity uh, is stronger on this side than on this side, and that means that the Earth's oceans adjust to that to form these two bulges, and as the Earth rotates, we experience high and, light, uh, high and low tide twice a day. And perhaps, again, that had an influence on life on Earth, because without the tides, perhaps life would never have moved from the oceans onto land. Perhaps the tidal zone was sort of a, a kind of a, a play school for life just to get a foothold on the land. So perhaps we wouldn't be here without the moon. The Earth, of course, also raises tides on the moon and the Earth's gravity is stronger. So the Earth's gravity is enough to distort the shape of the moon very slightly and that means that the moon always keeps one face turned towards us. So although the moon does turn on its axis, it turns once for every orbit around the Earth and that means we only ever see one side of the moon. And here it is, this is the side, we've all seen it, as B showed, that's the picture that we all have in our heads, most of us, when we think about the moon, and it's very, very beautiful, and people have been studying it for a, a very, very long time. And again, B and, and Bernard both showed these images. This is Galileo's drawing, the first time anyone drew the moon using a telescope. So the first really detailed picture of what the moon looked like. Galileo, of course, like everyone at that time, trained as an artist alongside his, his science training, astronomy and art, sat side by side in the classical curriculum. I say the first person to draw the moon through a telescope, he actually wasn't, because about two weeks before he did this, Thomas Harriot, just down the road at Science House, made this drawing. Not as beautiful as Galileo's, I have to say, perhaps not such a skilled artist, and he wasn't, he never really published it, because he had a patron, and he didn't really need to, um, to promote himself, whereas Galileo was freelance, and a very, very clever man, so he was really pushing his ideas. But Galileo's picture, of course, as he alluded to, quite shocking at the time because the idea was that the moon was in the sky, it was in heaven, so it was perfect and it was smooth and Galileo showed clearly it wasn't smooth, it was lumpy, it had mountains and craters that cast shadows. Uh, and that was a big challenge to the, um, the prevailing picture at the time. Throughout the 17th century, people, as telescope technology improves, they start making more and more maps of the moon. And there are these beautiful, um, their works of art, as well as um, scientific illustrations, really gorgeous. They're seeing the moon for the first time as a place with landscapes rather than just a patch of light in the sky. It's a real place like the Earth. And if the moon is a, is a place like the Earth, then perhaps the Earth is a place like the moon, again, challenging our idea that we live in a special place in the universe. And I saw this just before Christmas at the Royal Astronomical Society um, down in Piccadilly. One of their treasures they have on display um, temporarily is some Domenico, uh, Giovanni Domenico Cassini's beautiful detailed map of the moon from the 17th century. Really gorgeous. The, the best you could do with the telescope technology at the time, Cassini was, um, he was director of the, the Observatoire de Paris, big rival to the Greenwich Observatory where I work. We're all friends now, obviously. But he did this and it's really beautiful. Really, really detailed, really accurate. But at the limits of what the telescope technology of the time could show, 
Because he, like any astronomer, like any human being, where observation and experiment kind of give out, that's where imagination comes in. And just down here on the edge of the Bay of Rainbows, which is where the U2 lander is currently um, sitting, he added his wife. That's Madame Cassini there, immortalized on the moon. So imagination already in the 17th century. And this is a beautiful 19th century wall hanging, actually, that we have in our collections in Greenwich, um, used in working men's clubs in the 19th century to illustrate lectures about astronomy. This is part of, a big part of the um, self-improvement movement in the 19th century for the working classes. Um, these lectures illustrated with the latest discoveries in space. So this is almost sort of the um, 19th century kind of Brian Cox wonders of the universe. Really beautiful. I want to get it out and hang it up on, on my wall. And here's a, a lovely map prepared by Patrick Moore, who um, died obviously um, just over a year ago, much um, much missed, but not many people know that actually, as well as being a TV presenter, he was a great lunar observer, and he prepared some of the detailed maps in the 1950s that were used by the Apollo missions to choose their landing sites. So again, he's sort of immortalized on the moon. And here's some, some of the, the 1950s moon maps that he worked on that we have in our collections here in Greenwich. Beautifully detailed maps. Again, real works of art, really gorgeous. And this is really historic. Until 1959, no one in the history of the human race had seen what the other side of the moon looked like. This is the Soviet Luna 3 spacecraft, which in 1959 flew around the back of the moon. And this is the picture, the very grainy TV picture that it sent back. This, although it's not the best photograph ever, is the first time anybody in the history of the human race had seen the far side of the moon. So, stunning. I mean, Cassini, what would he have given to see something like this? All his studies. A lifetime of studies, he only saw one side of the moon. We can see both. Here are some modern images and mosaics of, of many, many photographs. And here is the far side compared to the near side. And as Bernard said, the two sides look very, very different. Uh, and B again alluded to this, that it's possibly due to that tidal locking of the moon to the Earth that the two sides have this very different character. And you can really see that if we go to false colour to illustrate the elevation. Really beautiful. Um, again, you know, this, this isn't obviously the real colours of the moon, but we're using colour here to allow our senses to get a better grasp of what uh, the structure and texture of the moon looks like. So you can see the near side these smooth lowland areas and the far side, the much more rugged highlands. Now, here is the Earth seen from the moon. Really beautiful picture. I apologise to Rob because I know he wants to keep Apollo out of the public of the moon. Um, but I think it's kind of difficult to talk about the moon without mentioning Apollo. And that's the beautiful blue marble picture, which kind of kick-started the environmental movement here on Earth. All of the astronauts who went there said one of the key things that they realised about the Earth was when, when you see it from the moon, there are no national borders. It's one world, and it's tiny. Neil Armstrong put his thumb up blocked out the moon, he said it didn't make me feel like a giant, it made me feel very, very small. And the moon, though, although it's so close to us, and similar in some ways, is also very different. It's a very harsh environment, and part of the reason for that comes from the sun, which on Earth, of course, is the sustainer of life, but on the moon, it poses problems. This is the sun seeing an ultraviolet light, and you can see it's a really violent place. And that ultraviolet radiation can do very nasty things to ourselves, and that's one of the reasons why we have to protect ourselves when we go to the moon. It's not naturally um, a, a, a kind of a, a, a habitable environment. Here on Earth, we have beautiful um, forests and plants, and they produce oxygen, one form of which is ozone, and of course ozone forms a layer in our atmosphere, which we're doing our best to destroy, but there you go. It, protects us from ultraviolet. On the moon, we don't have that. There is no atmosphere. We're above the Earth's atmosphere, and the moon has no atmosphere of its own. So radiation from the sun is a problem. And there's another problem from the sun. This is a picture during the eclipse when the moon is blocking the sun, but you can see around it this glowing sort of outer atmosphere, the corona, and the sun is constantly spitting out not just heat and light, but a whole stream of particles called the solar wind that fly out into the solar system. And you can see here the violence on the sun, these explosions taking place, look at this enormous arch that the Earth could roll underneath that. All of that spitting out into the solar system, um, very, very violent processes. Can you look at that? And again, all of these things cause damage to our DNA. Why aren't we affected here on Earth? Well, because we have sci-fi shields. We have force fields around us. Here's the Earth. Here's the interior of the Earth with our um, molten outer core of iron rotating with the Earth, and that generates a magnetic field. And there you go. Um, you can see really generated around the Earth. And that protects us 
from radiation from the sun. These particles are diverted, and only a few of them get in around the polar regions where they're mopped up by our atmosphere, producing these beautiful displays of light. So the northern lights, the southern lights, beautiful displays caused by solar radiation. Um, very beautiful on Earth, but um, gorgeous, not that amazing. The moon doesn't have that liquid outer core, at least it's not generating a magnetic field. The surface of the moon is not protected, and all of that stuff makes it to the ground. Um, so being above the Earth's atmosphere and the moon not having its own atmosphere is a problem. Now the Earth's atmosphere also protects us from other things. Um, I'm sure everybody has seen one of these, a shooting star. These are meteorites or meteors, and they become meteorites that hit the atmosphere and burn up. Um, and the Earth protects us from many of them. Most of them don't make it to the ground. They have to be pretty big, like this one last year, um, which exploded over Chelyabinsk in Russia. Some of the really big ones do make it to the ground. This is Arizona, a meteor crater, perhaps a 50-meter asteroid about 50,000 years ago, um, exploding on the ground. But all of the smaller objects are mopped up by the atmosphere. On the moon, of course, that's not the case. They have big craters, but they also have little craters. Everything hits the surface of the moon. So you really need to protect yourself um, from tiny things, and these are, uh, this is an impact on the shuttle windscreen of a micrometeorite. So even tiny things like a grain of sand can do real damage to you. They can go through a spacesuit. So you want to be very careful when you're on the surface like this. Now this is a, another Apollo pitch. I'm so sorry, wrong. <laughs> but just to make the point that humans have not been back to the moon for 42 years. But there may be reasons why we might want to go back. I mean, here is a picture of what Neil Armstrong described very poetically as the magnificent desolation of the lunar surface. Really stunningly bleak, but gorgeously beautiful landscape. But there are reasons why we might want to go back. I mean, this is one of my favorite sci-fi movies of recent years, Duncan Jones's Moon. And the whole premise of this is a base on the moon, which is being used to mine helium-3 from the lunar soil. And there's a very um, interesting image at the beginning of the film where you see the surface of the moon with these great strips mined out of it. And that's something that we're going to have to think about realistically. One of the questions alluded to this idea of environmental damage on the moon. If we go there, if we do start to exploit its resources, who decides what's allowable and what isn't allowable? Well, you remember Madame Cassini on the moon, here she is at the edge of the Bay of Rainbows, and of course both um, Bernard and um, B were talking about uh, you two, the Jade Rabbit. Jade Rabbit in the Bay of Rainbows, how poetic is that? And there, there he is, that's the landing site, you've just seen this little shadow, amazing. Um, and You've seen these pictures already, but I just wanted to show them again because they're beautiful. And here is, this is, this is the jade rabbit. This is what it's named after. This is the, the pattern that, that Chinese um, people have traditionally seen on the surface of the moon. I think this is like a sort of pestle and mortar thing that he has. I don't know what he's doing with it, but gorgeous, gorgeous pictures. And of course, um, Bernard alluded to the Google Lunar X post. We're going to have to start thinking about this commercial exploitation of the moon very soon because it's starting to happen already. Google are sponsoring the Lunar X Prize. Uh, I think it's very exciting, but it does raise these ethical issues. There are many, many teams all around the world right now planning to be the first private organization to put a rover on the moon, just like the Chinese have done. Um, and really, this is a direct descendant of something that's 300 years old this year, the Longitude Prize, which is a British government prize to promote with the idea of somebody solving the problem of finding longitude of the sea. Of course, John Harrison won it with his uh, amazing clock that we have in Greenwich. Do you come and see it? Um, <laughs> advert over. But it's kick-started this whole idea of science prizes to challenge private individuals to try and solve a problem. Um, and here are some of the teams. This is the team that I've met, the, um, the part-time scientists from Germany. Rather um, a misnomer because they are really dedicated guys. But students, and these are not people who are paid to explore the moon. They're doing it off their own backs. And here are some of the other um, contenders. Not an exhaustive list. 2015, next year is the year to watch. That's when they've got to do it. They have to send their rover to the moon, land it, and travel 500 meters, and then send a moon cast back to Earth to win the prize money. Will they do it? Who knows? But they're having a really good crack at it. Um, and there's also a planetarium show that Google has sponsored, which we'll be hosting in Greenwich um, in a couple of months. Do come and see it. I've seen it. It's really, really good. Um, again, advert over. Now, if I say foster and partners good. to you, you, you've seen it too, haven't you? It's, it's genuinely very good. It's like being on the moon, almost. Now, foster and partners, architects, you might think, Gherkin, you might think Millennium Bridge. What happens when Foster and Partners team up 
with the European Space Agency. Well, this is what happens. Foster and Partners uh, worked with them over the last couple of years to design a way of building a sustainable moon base. Um, and the way they're going to do it is by using 3D printing technology to print the moon base out of lunar soil. Um, and here's their architectural model that they made that they also use the soil and the simulant and 3D printing it. Really amazing. So a really major architecture company has devoted time and effort to this. They're not expecting to build it next year, but they think it's actually something that they want to be involved in. And so this was a genuine collaboration with the European Space Agency. Um, so this is something we all have to think about. What do we want to do with the moon? It belongs to everybody, but some people are going to have more chances than others to, uh, to use it. And I want to kind of finish now on a more poetic note. This is the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter that, again, both B and Bernard alluded to. It's a NASA project. It's been orbiting the moon since 2009. And its main goal is to map the moon in vast detail. It's about 50 kilometers above the surface, quite low. And it's been taking images on a Google Earth kind of scale. And you can actually access all of these. They're all free to look at on the internet. And although there's a huge amount of science that you can do with those images, and that's, of course, why the mission has been funded, we can learn so much about the moon, its geology, its relationship to the Earth, our own origins. Uh, but there's something else that it's done, which I think is really amazing. Um, here are some of the close-up pictures it took of the Apollo landing sites. So they, these are the actual remnants of the lander still there after 40 years on the surface. Um, but look at this. This is a picture of a central peak. Um, it's just over a kilometre tall, a mountain at the centre of Tycho Crater. Um, and this is at dawn, casting a, a sharp shadow. So this is nearly as high as Ben Nevis. Um, to the, you know, Snowdonia kind of type of mountain. Really gorgeous, we can zoom in yeah. to individual boulders. And obviously a lot of science in these images, but a lot of beauty as well. These, I think, are such detailed, intimate portraits of the moon. All of these subtle shades of grey and black. Really, really gorgeous. And I'm not really going to describe what, what these pictures are because I just want you to look at them as objects of beauty. These are landscapes. These are real places that we can see for the first time in human history. And I noticed in the um, We Colonised the Moon part of this exhibition a lovely placard that said, Save the Moon for the Poets. And as a scientist, I would be very happy to share the moon with poets because I think images like this from the um, LRO mission and, and other missions show us that actually sometimes science can be poetry as well. Thank you very much. Um, it's because of the tides. Um, if you think about those two bulges of, of water on either side of the Earth, they act as, as giant brake blocks, really, as the Earth spins. Those tides are trying to slow the Earth down, and as they do that, they force the moon to spiral away from the Earth. So it's been doing that since it formed. It used to be much, much closer. Um, it's now, um, you know, um, 300,000 kilometers away from us. It will get further and further away. Um, Eventually, eventually, if we had infinite amounts of time, we'd end up in a situation where we, the Earth and the Moon would be tightly locked to each other, so they permanently, the Moon already permanently presents one face to us, but the Earth would also present one face to the Moon, and that would mean that you'd only be able to see the Moon from one side of the Earth. But long before that happens, the Sun will swell up to a red giant and destroy both the Earth and the Moon, so not something to worry about. But it does mean that gradually over millions of years, the tides will become less strong, um, and, and the moon's the period of the moon's orbit will get longer, and also our day will continue to get longer. It's about five milliseconds per century at the moment. The, the day gets longer, so it's it's measurable, and that's why we have the extra pit in the radio signals, um, the, the radio time signals. Sometimes it's partly to correct that lengthening of, of the day. Thank you. 
Could you say who you are first as well, so we have a sense of who's in the audience? Okay. Um, well, hello, I'm, I'm Sophie. I am um, a student of politics, um, so I'm quite interested in this in general in sort of international relations. Um, I think my, my question was already partly answered um, there, and I, I would just like to thank you all for your speeches. Um, uh, what I would like to say, because you said in your, um, you said that the moon was essentially a stabilizing mechanism for the Earth. Uh, but if the moon would suddenly like disappear one day, would that mean that the that the Earth would prefer to the original state would be more unbalanced, or would would you not see that kind of difference? If you could magically make the moon disappear, um, you, you would notice all sorts of differences. So for a start, the tides would pretty much disappear. Part of the tides is due to the gravity of the sun, but only about a third. So the tides would become much less strong, and that would have severe environmental effects um, all around the world. Um, and the other thing is, yes, the Earth's axis would become less stable. If you think about those little um, spinning tops that you get in Christmas crackers, if you spin it on the table, they spin around, but they also kind of they wobble from side to side, and that's exactly what planetary um, axes do as well. And the moon, just the gravity of the moon acts as almost a kind of a, almost like a, sort of a, a piece of invisible string that just keeps everything stabilised. With that gone. The Earth's axis would tilt, and we'd be talking about over a period of just a few thousand years, the axis could do this, it could do that, so we could have no seasons, we could have really extreme seasons. Again, severe environmental disruption. I think every ecosystem currently on Earth would, would be destroyed by that kind of rapid motion. So we're lucky to have the moon, really. Thank you. I'm going to abuse my position as, as chair and ask you one. Um, you mentioned that you would be happy to share the moon with poets. Um, moon is one of my favorite movies as well. How do you feel about commercial actors going out there? Well, it, it's, it's an interesting... I, I get excited about the fact that, that all sorts of people are going back to the moon, and it's really exciting. Um, I'm not entirely opposed to using the resources of the moon. There may be very interesting things that could have real beneficial effects down here on Earth. But if you look at the, the history, and this is my, my complete personal view, the history of our exploitation of our own planet, it's not, it's not a, a pretty one. And I think here we have a chance to, whatever we do up there, to be more responsible um, and to make sure that, as the Apollo astronauts said when they first landed, we come in peace for all mankind and that, that what we do up there is a benefit to, to everybody. It's really good to see that in the recent um, space missions there has been so much cooperation between different countries. Um, you know, the, the Chinese land okay has the, the Chinese flag on it, but why not? You know, they paid for it. But they're, they're collaborating with the European Space Agency. There's a lot of, in the science community anyway, internationalist kind of spirit. And I think everybody, I know, you know, I can see Bee and, and Bernard nodding here. We all, as scientists, feel that this is something that, that the whole of humanity is involved in. And, and I would hope that, that that spirit is respected in whatever way that we, that we go back. So, you know, it's, um, it's, it's interesting. We live in a very interesting, it's unprecedented. No one has been able to do this before. I suppose the only real comparison we have is, is the exploration of somewhere like Antarctica, where nobody lives, so, you know, there's no native population. Um, and, you know, we, we've done all right at keeping Antarctica, you know, um, safe so far, but it's a delicate situation and there are moves to try and exploit it. Um, in all sorts of ways, and you know, I think the moon is going to be a similar situation. So we'll have to wait and see. Thanks very much. Um